I want you to get this. When it comes to the Word of God, I don't care what your IQ level is. I don't care what your socioeconomic status is. I don't care if you understand a lot of the things many of us deeper go. Because one, one of the things I have found, you can have somebody that may not be doing with Genesis 6 and Genesis 3 and all these different things. And I mean, uh, one lady that I talked with up there, she said, you know, especially during lunch when I was sitting there just talking, she says, you really got out in the, in the, not only into orbit, you were kind of floating around out there at the edge of the galaxy, but you brought it back in. And some of us tend to do that. But let me tell you something, there are those that may never get into that, but the practicality of spiritual warfare, the practicality of walking in the Word, they have a depth that many of us in orbit may not have. See, it's, it's different levels, but every single one of us, regarding at that level, when I'm in Messiah, I now receive an anointing to learn the Word, to learn how to walk in the kingdom, because the one who wrote this book moved on the inside of me when I made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. And in the compiling of this, as knowledge begins to take hold, and the only way you can get knowledge is you've got to study. What was the thing that the Apostle Paul told Timothy? Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Hebraically, the study of the word is the highest form of worship. It's the form of worship that God called Abraham to. Come walk with me, learn my ways. And what blows people's minds is before Moses, Abram was known for a man who walked in the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God. Not only did Abraham walk in them, he taught them to his children before Moses. Why? Because he was walking with the lawgiver. He was walking with the commandment giver. As he walked with God, God began to give Abram an anointing to where he began to learn the ways of God, and it began to wash out Babylon out of here and reestablish the kingdom as he walked with God. You have that anointing. I have that anointing. I'm tired of Christians that do the same thing 5,000 times and never get any results and think it's going to work on the 5,000th and 1th time. Because they heard a testimony from somebody else who gave a testimony that worked 500 years ago. There's an anointing. There is the Apostle John in 1 John said, we have an unction of the Holy Spirit that, that we know. And I, I tell you what, I know when the anointing begins to flow when I've got on the right rabbit trail whether it's studying or preaching, I know when God begins to lead me off or show something different or begin to unfold things that I never saw. If the anointing is there and there is a witness of the Holy Spirit because the anointing of Messiah to learn and to connect the dots and begin to pull in wisdom, to begin to pull in understanding is there, I know that I'm on to something. Every single one of us have it to a certain degree. Now, what I have learned about the anointings of Messiah, they're like a muscle. The more you use them, the more you develop strength in those areas. The anointing of knowledge is like all the other anointings all rolled up together and running on a high octane. How many times have I heard Christians say, well, the Holy Spirit will bring me into remembrance of what I need in the hour that I need it to speak, so I don't need to study. He said he would bring it to your remembrance. How can he bring it to your remembrance if you've never heard it, never studied it? We've lost the art of meditating on God's Word. We've lost the art of, of studying God's Word and being, and one of the things I have been amazed about my wife is that a lot of times God will just have her say, go to this chapter in Isaiah, go to this chapter in Ezekiel, and, and, and he's, he's trying to reveal something to her. Now, it doesn't always come immediately because she's got to sit and let that anointing begin to flow and she begins to pray over it, begins to dig a little bit and, and to look at the, the full scope of what the Word is saying because the deeper things of God don't, do not come easily. 
It's you, you, you got to simmer in it. You got to you got to spend the time meditating and praying through it, and and say, okay, now because her and I can look at the same scriptures, and there's a general knowledge of the Word of God that's there that we her and I can agree on. But for me, there may be a section of it God is trying to bring a now word, and he'll, he'll bring out a certain aspect for Mike Lake that may not be for Mary. But when Mary reads it, she'll, the Holy Spirit will cause a whole other section to begin exploding in meaning as she reads it. That's that anointing going into operation. And the knowledge begins to flow because it's the knowledge of the kingdom beginning to flow in and out of us. And we begin developing it. This next one. Not only knowledge, perception. Perception. The perception of our universe is too small. Our perception of the world around us is too small. We have been programmed to dismiss the supernatural. And I'll be straight up because, you know, I look at the secularists. You see, those that are secular and that was the very foundation of secularism, from Francis Bacon on, all those men that perpetrated that and perpetrated devoiding the concept of God outside of society, even within sciences, every one of them were an occultist. Every single one of them. They were into the mystery religions. So it's a ruse. It's to dumb down the masses so that if you don't understand that everything first starts spiritually and then works its way down, you miss everything that God is doing. There is a, there, there's, there's something that within the occult they call a Gregory that right now is wanting to be loosed in America. It was loosed during the revolutionary or the French Revolution that begins to feed the violence, and then when the violence goes, it feeds off the violence, which breeds more violence to the place that there is a spirit behind all the violence and all the murder and all the vileness. That is waiting to be released on America with, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, different movements the left are trying to do. Antifa and Black Lives Matters. And unfortunately, Black Lives Matters is not really about Black Lives Matters. It's another agenda, which is the sadness of it. Because the black community have went through some horrendous things that it needs to be adjusted in society to bring in line with the Constitution. The Constitution was 1,000 years ahead of its time. All men are created equal. I don't care the color of your skin. All men are created equal. That was, that was, that was the superlative that they were aiming for. Now, society wasn't there, but the, their hope was that we would grow into it. And we haven't. See, there's a spirit behind all of that. There's a spirit of division. One of these days when the weird stuff really shows up, the whole definition of humanity is going to change. It's not the color of your skin. It's, is your DNA still pure? Or have you been augmented to become something else, something very old, something very bad when the watchers release their technologies on humanity? Let me tell you something. They're striving for that and they're pouring billions of dollars across every nation on the planet to develop super soldiers to do enhancements. They are committed like you wouldn't believe because they're, they're on this appointment with the judgment of God and they've got to get there before that can happen. And we've got to have our, our, our paradigm, our perception of the reality around us has got to change. When it does, you can't even go shopping the same without taking authority. Because you know what's out in the world. The minute you leave your home, we're, we're supposed to create a, an atmosphere of heaven in our homes. And the minute you leave that property, you're leaving the ambassadorial estate for the kingdom of God the minute you pull out your driveway. And you've got to learn how to function in the authority in hostile territory. Spiritually. In many places in our nation, it is physically manifested. They can outlaw guns, and it doesn't matter. They get them anyway. And in some countries where they've outlawed guns, they're using knives. They're using rocks. You know, you can't outlaw rocks, especially in Missouri. That won't work. They had to outlaw Drano because they were using that to attack people and throwing. There's, there's this violence. The only way they can stop it is when our perception changes because we're moving in the knowledge of the kingdom 
and we can start saying, I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that heaven would take notice of the injustice and the travesties that are going on. And Father, I ask that you would send warring angels to come against the principality over America, the principality over the EU, the principality over the UN, the principality over the elite. Father, send warring angels to war in our behalf, and we begin seeking heaven that we might re- that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we can receive help in a time of need. And you got to know when to do it. And if there wasn't ever a time, how about right now? As much as I love our current president, I mean, he's as rough as sandpaper, which is kind of refreshing because you never have to wonder about what he thinks. He's not the answer. The kingdom of God is the answer. And as long as he remains an extension of what God is doing in America, He'll continue to be president, and no matter what they do, it's not going to work. But the minute he steps out of that will be his worst nightmare. Just like you. But it doesn't stop with perception, skill. How skillful are you in handling the Word of God? How skillful are you in prayer? How skillful are you in spiritual warfare? How skillful are you in hearing the Word of God? Hearing the voice of God? moving in the love of God. Skill is something that is developed. Therefore, there is an anointing for as you accumulate knowledge, you begin accumulating skill on how to properly use it. Like learning tools or anything else, that, with that knowledge comes experience, and with that experience comes skill. I remember the first time I shot a weapon in the military, I couldn't hit a broad side of the barn But by the time I was through, I was hitting 39 out of 40. And the only reason I didn't get 40 is because the gun jammed. You develop skill with reason of use. Have you been using the knowledge that God has given you to develop prayer? To really develop confidence in the power of the name of Jesus? Don't wait for a tidal wave to be coming at you or a tsunami of the enemy for you to learn how to use the name of Jesus. It's better for you to use it on a little a, a demon of fear about this big instead of Godzilla. And if we're obedient, that's the way God lines it up. Learn here, learn from it. Okay, get that knowledge, get confidence, get skill so that eventually, you see, before David fought Goliath, He fought a lion, he fought a bear, and there were probably little things he fought before that maybe running off coyotes or whatever they have over there. But the more he grew and with expertise in his weapons and confidence with God, the bigger the thing went down. And what's interesting about the, with David, with the, even with his fighting with Goliath, prior to fighting with Goliath, Saul said, put on my armor. Saul was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. His sword was bigger. David tried to put it on, said, this all feels clunky to me. I haven't used it. Let me go back and get my shepherd's staff and my shepherd's sling. But after he took down Goliath, he didn't go back and get King Saul's sword. The one that fit his hand was Goliath's sword. Because with his perception had changed, he had developed skill in that kind of warfare. And so for that day on, when he led men in battle, he was carrying the sword of Goliath. You want to talk about a broadsword. Because with experience, he learned and developed skill. Unfortunately, there are some of us in the body of Christ that we've not been learning anything. We've been depending upon everybody else. We go through the motions, and we're supposed to have a broadsword that's about eight foot long, and every time the devil shows up, we go, I'm going to get you with my pen knife. Because we've not learned to flow in that anointing. The great news right now is the Holy Spirit is enabling us to catch up. If we'll yield, kneel, surrender, there's an anointing for us to catch up. The next thing this Hebrew word means is discernment. Now there are two types of discernment. There's a discernment based upon the Holy Ghost showing you that something's wrong. Discernment of spirits. The other discernment you get out of practical experience. Some will call it street smarts. 
You know, I watch Carl Gallup. Now, he's, I, I love the brother, and you can tell that no, he, he can be in pastor mode and sheriff mode all at the same time. That, you know, when, when he preaches, he's constantly scanning the room. He's scanning the room, not only for those to make sure that you're actually connecting with the people when you're preaching. At the same time, he's constantly scanning the room for threats. Because he knows if a person moves a certain way or does a certain thing, he can have discernment from practical experience that something's wrong. We need to, and this is one of the things Christians don't do. We don't learn from what we go through because we never reflect on it. That's why we do the same thing 500 times expecting different results. Because somebody preached it real good and promised me an instantaneous blessing if I did it, a shortcut, instead of actually going back to the Word, repenting and changing our behavior to match with the Word. When you do that, demons flee. Because you start getting equipped, you start moving in anointing, you start moving, you start developing the armor of God in your life. Come on now. When was the last time you spent time in prayer reflecting on what God brought you through in the last six months? What did you learn? I mean, even in, in my day-to-day -day thing, there's a program I follow with Michael Hyatt. And this is, you know, Michael Hyatt's a Christian. He used to be the president, Thomas Nelson, but he's doing it from an entrepreneurial point of view. And there's a journal, and one of the things they said is, what new did you learn today, and how does that apply to your vision? Day, and, and it's just a journal that asks the same things day after day after day because there is an expectancy from life that you approach things that you have never approached before. The enemy is going to come at you a different way than you ever had before. And that as you are confronted by the, by the circumstances in life in this evil world, that you learn something from what you went through and you sit back and say, what did I learn? Has the enemy changed his strategies against me? And if he has, what kingdom principle do I apply to adapt to that? That's a vital part of discernment. Guys, we have, we have been in neutral for so long that it's cost us immeasurably. We've been in Laodicea for so long that as long as we think that we can throw money at it, it's going to work. A lot of times you don't need to throw money at it. How about throwing repentance and obedience at it? We need to learn. But what's twinned with knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Now what's interesting because it's kind of circular because everything in, in, in the Bible, there's, there is a rhythm, there is a cycle to it. The feasts have cycles, the seasons have cycles. In fact, there's even spiritual seasons to our lives. Messiah feared the Lord, and because of that, the Spirit of God rested upon him. And when he gets to the end of this and starts moving in knowledge, he gets a fresh anointing for a higher level of respect for God. Now, one of the things I hear from a lot of Christians is, I, you know, I, I've been stuck at the same place forever. And I just spin my wheels. The only way to get out of that is to earn a deeper respect for God. Because the truth of the matter is, you wouldn't have got into the miry clay that you got into if your respect for God was greater. You'd have come up to that pit that the enemy was trying to make look great in your life and say, I, I respect God too much to get into that. That's, he's, his, my relationship with him is too precious. But what makes the devil's life hell? And how many are tired of him making your life hell? It's time to start making his life hell. Is when you twin together the knowledge that you get from walking with God and in the word and through experience with walking with him and you couple it 
with a greater level of respect for God. You become the devil's worst nightmare because it enables you to go to the next level and to go from precept to precept, from glory to glory. He begins, he puts, he, God begins writing new lines of understanding in you that is mortared together with respect for God. There have been times, and Mary and I have talked about this, we'll be listening to, uh, when, we, when we used to listen to a lot of Christian television, and people would be preaching stuff, and I'd just start shaking my head. That ain't right. That is not right. That is not right. They're exegeting it wrong, and the reason they are is I know God, and I have a more respect for God. That's why the hyper-grace movement should fall flat on its face, because if you had a respect for God, you wouldn't preach grace that way. Grace is not an excuse for sin. It is the power of God to overcome the sin that so easily besets you. In fact, there's one Christian song, there's one line in it that really kind of bothers me. It's talking about grace and you're feeling like you got away with something. No, 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 that's the wrong kind of grace. It ain't you got away with something. It's that grace has covered me so that now I'm free of that something never to do it again in my life. We got to have this healthy respect for God. And guys, these two anointings are a rare thing. We only receive them released in a few in each generation but I believe the reason for rarity is because it is a rare thing of having this level of awe, reverence, and fear developed in the life of a leader. If we had more leaders that feared God, we'd have more congregants that would fear the Lord. In every church split that ever was, there was no fear of God. In every pastor that has fallen, there was, not, there was not the proper level of fear of God. In so many of the situations we find ourselves in where we get tripped up by the enemy, it's because there wasn't enough fear of God. We didn't fear God enough not to cross the line. We messed up. You know, the Word tells us in Psalms 111.10 and, and Proverbs 9 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Takes us back full cycle. How can I get the Spirit of God to rest on me like he rested on Jesus? Fear God. Respect him. Honor him. John tells us because he was obedient to the things that God told him to do, that he had the anointing without measure. Now in Ozarkian, that's a whole bunch. It knows no limit. There's no limit to the level of these anointings that you can walk in if you develop the proper respect for God. So even if, I, if the Lord tarries, I get to 60, I still got more levels to go. If the Lord tarries and I get to 70, there's more levels to go. Moses got to 120, and when God told him it was time for him to go, his response was, but I have just begun to see your glory. Moses saw that there were more levels that he could, Moses, okay, the one who had a veil on his face because he showed with the glory of God, the one who brought down the Ten Commandments, the, ones that, the one that God used, sent him into Egypt with a stick. And he brings down the most powerful nation on the planet at that time with a stick. At the end of his life, his respect for God was so powerful, he said, I'm not done learning yet. There's more levels for me to go. There's more levels for you to go, guys. I'm wanting to have a Jonathan Edwards experience one of these days in these conferences. That I've got to put down my notes and just shut up because the Chabot of God is in that place and no, no priest can stand to minister and people are just crying out, running to the altar and there's no need to even get to them to pray because as soon as they hit the altar, God is dealing with them, demons are leaving, healings are being done. 
That's a level I want to see. I think it's a level that we're going to see in the last days. Oh, because God isn't done with us yet. We are called to something greater. This generation is called to something greater than church as usual. It's going to eclipse the assemblies of God. It's going to eclipse the church of God. It's going to eclipse the Baptist church. It's going to eclipse everything that we have seen in the Reformation from the time that Martin Luther, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, said the just shall live by faith, and to now it will eclipse it all because the threat will be greater than ever before. But let me tell you something. The kingdom of God is up to the challenge. And if we'll yield, we'll see that challenge manifested in us because the devil can't bring his A-team when God doesn't bring His. Because there's going to be parity in the days ahead. There are going to be people raised up in the supernatural power of God. People always try to figure out the 144,000. They know so many of this tribe, so many of that tribe, so many of this tribe. They missed the whole point. They were made supernatural virgins because they had never slept with the whore of Babylon. That's why I have hope for the younger generation. I've actually seen in the natural where women that were promiscuous that before they got saved, God restored their virginity after they got saved supernaturally. You see, there's a cleansing by the blood of Jesus that's going to come on a lot of people and it'll be as if they had never been a part of Mystery Babylon at all in their lives because God's going to do a work. Let it be in our lives. Father God, we just thank you today. Father, we thank you for this, this series of messages. Father, I ask that it would open our eyes for our need for the anointings of Messiah in our life and, and realize that all seven of them, they're ours, they belong to us. Jesus paid the price so that we could walk in them. We need to claim them, pay the price to walk in them by committing to the kingdom. Father, I ask for a fresh anointing to do that in our lives and that we would so fear you that the fear of the world would evaporate in our lives. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.